Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at UNC Pembroke. My guest today is artist Josh Adams. Josh has worked for Marvel and DC Comics, as well as Sci-Fi Channel, the WWE, and IDW as the artist for the Doctor Who comic book series. He's also the son of Neil Adams, a legend in the world of comic book art. Welcome, Josh. Hi. How are you doing? Doing well. How are you today? I am fantastic. Woke up a couple hours ago. <laughs> well, I'd like to talk a little bit about your background. Um, as I mentioned before, your father works in comics and owns Continuity Studios. <laughs> Um, creating everything from comic art to animations to print advertisements. Uh, and a number of top comic artists have come through the studio's door. So how did that influence you and your uh, artistic uh, development? It's, it's kind of interesting because when I was growing up, uh, my father had for the most part been out of comic books. He hadn't been doing much in the way of comic books, apart from maybe continuity publishing themselves. Uh, but even then, it was sort of the end of that time. He had been doing mostly advertising and I had known lots of comic artists throughout my life, but having grown up in an advertising studio, I hadn't really known much of their relevance to you know, the comic world. And it really wasn't until I was about a teenager that my father had started getting back into comic books that I, I sort of realized the grand scope of my father's influence and the studio's influence in the comic book industry and got to see continuity studios for what it was back in the 70s, or the 60s and 70s. Um, that's, that being said, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of getting to know uh, many comic book greats throughout my entire life, and uh, I think my interactions with them just from a friendly basis and sort of a family kind of basis has given me a deeper respect for the work that they do and uh, the kind of commitment it takes to be a comic book artist. Because these are people who have families and have lives and take time out of their day to go do fun things. And when you're a comic book artist, you're spending you know, excessive amounts of time just to produce this very oddly archaic form of entertainment when you compare it to you know, television or video games or film, you know, this, this printed comic book. It's, it's such a, an old form and it takes so, so much work to make. And so being able to know these people throughout my entire childhood, know that they have lives, you know, that they're not locked up in a room all day, uh, was a very interesting thing, uh, realization for me when I started to do comic book work. Because I would lock myself away for long periods of time just to make deadlines. Mm -hmm. I'd boggle my mind trying to figure out how did these guys do it? How do they you know, spend all this time working on comic books and then still have time to go out to lunch and hang out with their friends? Mm -hmm. And now, um, are you still working on the Doctor Who comic series? I am not currently working on the Doctor Who comic series. Uh, IDW had lost the license to it, and so uh, Titan Comics has picked it up. Uh, I've been talking with Titan Comics about the possibility of doing some stuff, but we haven't scheduled anything yet. They uh, are fans of my work, so we'll see. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I, I met you at the NC Comic Con, and uh, you were working on, I think, uh, you know, a convention sketch of Doctor Who, and I was just amazed at how, uh, seemingly from the top of your head, off the top of your head, you were able to uh, create the likeness of the actor uh, who's playing the Doctor. Um, it just fascinated me. But what are the challenges when you work on a licensed property like Doctor Who? Do you have to uh, get approval for the artwork from the, you know, the BBC, or is it something where it's just, you know, the regular structure where an editor looks at it and something along those lines? Uh, with, uh, with licensed work, there is uh, many levels of approval. Uh, when I first started working on Doctor Who, uh, I just had to draw, the first thing I had to do was draw faces. Just lots and lots of faces of the different actors, and that had to get approved by the BBC. They had to know that I could make their actors, you know, or make my drawings look like their actors. Uh, and from there, it became, uh, every time I draw something for the comic book, the BBC would have to approve it. And it's something I'm used to, because I used to do, well, I still do a lot of work for the WWE. And uh, with that, every time you draw one of their superstars, it has to get, you know, approved, and the likeness has to be good. And uh, as a fan of wrestling, I, uh, I have a personal uh, investment in it, because I've get, gotten the opportunity to meet many pro wrestlers, and I even recently met Matt Smith. And, uh, you know, when you meet those people, you want to know that the art you do is something they approve of. 
and something they say that does look like me instead of you know that looks like an embarrassing version of me. I actually saw just the other day. Uh, there's so many websites out there that list like, you know lists of ten or fifteen random things. Yeah, you know, like fifteen celebrities who look like they could be them. I don't know, like weird like uh, types of sites. But there was one that had uh, uh, celebrity fan art. As people who just do random drawings of celebrities, and then the, the, the website took photos of the celebrities and morphed them to look like the drawings. So that gave me a nice, interesting perspective on well, at least I'm doing it right. And so people who actually I do drawings of don't look at it and go, "Well, that doesn't look like me. That doesn't look like some weird monster version." Of me. Well, it's it's funny uh, because I remember um, when I was much younger. Uh, the Star Wars comic came out, and I don't know if Marvel made any real attempt to uh, make the characters look like, you know, Harrison Ford or Mark Hamill. It just, that's Luke, that's, you know, Han Solo. Um, and even their Chewbacca always seemed a little bit off. Uh, so it's interesting to see that, you know, um, organizations are more um, uh, aware of the, the power of comics and trying to control the, um, the, the likeness, the image, to make sure that it's, you know, on model. Now oh, there's the dog. Yeah. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned that you've done work for the WWE, and uh, pro wrestling is different from comics. So, um, you know, how is it, because I, I will admit, I work on a pro wrestling television show in our area. The Carolinas are the, uh, the home of many of the, the top stars in the WWE. Um, woo! Woo! Ric Flair, good old Ric Flair. We'd love to have him on our show. Um, but uh, how do you go from, uh, you know, comic art to... Uh, from comic art to uh, to this WWE style uh, promotional art, uh, it's uh, it's not that hard. I do I do a lot of uh, you know most of my work has to do with likenesses. So uh, you know the nice thing about WWE is it's it's sort of like a living comic book. Mm -hmm. You know it's it's got that larger than life feel. It's you know muscle bound people you know, flying across the ring. So it's, it's not that much of a, of a departure. And having been a lifelong wrestling fan, I always enjoy it. Uh, one of my first experiences with wrestling, uh, I guess with art and wrestling, was I used to do uh, anatomy studies using photos of pro wrestlers because you know, we're going to get cool action shots of you know, muscle-bound people doing athletic things. And so one of the ones I had done was Rob Van Dam. And uh, it just so happened that he had opened a comic book store and was promoting it at San Diego Comic Con. And I had a bunch of my character studies with me. I was about, I want to say 16 at the time, maybe 17. And I had one, I had one that I did of him. So uh, I went to his booth and I, I gave it to him. I said, you know, here you go, I did this for a study and I want you to have it. And uh, he was so like happy about it, he thought it was really cool. You know, thank me and pose for a photo with me and you know, invited me to come down to his store. And then the next day, I came by his booth again. And he wasn't there that day, unfortunately. But uh, one of the guys at his table said that, uh, you know, Rob liked your piece so much, he wanted me to give you this. And he gave me a pair of his wrestling boots and knee pads, signed and dedicated to me. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. And then uh, he actually emailed me a few days later and personally invited me to his store. And we've been friends ever since. So it's been the the wrestling world kind of has that almost a, a similar approachability that you can get in the comic world with comic conventions and things like that. Made us to be friends with a lot of these guys. Well, you know, we had um, uh, the opportunity to speak to uh, Maria Canellis, I believe is her last name. Uh, she was one of the mm -hmm. WWE divas, and now she's with Ring of Honor. Um, and she was basically saying that wrestling is comic books brought to life because it's the larger than life co uh, characters, it's the costumes, it's the, you know, big situations that everyone's in. Um, so there, there does seem to be this, uh, this fertile uh, ground for comic fans and wrestling fans to, to come together and, and start something new and exciting. Um, so that's, that's kind of fun. Uh, we, we had once um, uh, Chris Sims from Comics Alliance who also writes uh, some wrestling blogs. And the conversation ended up just going off into wrestling for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so we were tempted to change the name to Wrestling Culture. But, um, but let's, let's talk storytelling a little bit. Uh, would you explain to our audience 
the, uh, the concept of uh, sequential art and visual storytelling from what's essentially, you're given a, a script description of, of what the action is per page or the Marvel style, just kind of like an outline of the action? Uh, these days, uh, the writers have a, a lot bigger hand in the storytelling aspect of it. Uh, the way it was described to me when I was learning, uh, this was by Klaus Janssen, was uh, basically you have a comic book and you have to make it entertaining and understandable to a person who has never even heard of comic books and no idea what your content is. So it has to be, it has to be clear, it has to be entertaining, and it has to be compelling. And it, has to, it has to kind of combine all these aspects in still pictures. And you've got a lot to compete with these days. So you have to, it has to be this perfect marriage of writing and art that, it's hard to explain, honestly, it's, it's very hard to explain the magic that comes when you get a comic book and it has that perfect balance of dialogue, explanation, visual, where you read a panel, or you read a word balloon in the panel, and your eyes absorb the image, and you don't feel like you've done two separate aspects of the process. Because that's the problem. You can feel it very instantly when you start reading a page, and you read word balloon to word balloon to word balloon to word balloon. Then you go to the next page, and you realize you didn't really look at any of those visuals. Or you look at all the visuals and you're so amazed or confused or distracted by the visuals that you can't barely take the time to process the words. It's, it has to be an amazing symmetry between writer and artist. And that's one of the biggest challenges in storytelling. There has to be that understanding between the two people. That a writer is going to write their script and they're going to put in enough dialogue that they feel would convey the story without distracting from the visuals. Because when you distract from the visuals, you don't get the whole story when you distract the words from the whole story. So to me, it's always been a balance of you know, the, the words versus the images. And that's what makes comics such a challenging uh, form of entertainment to, to, to do. And there's not much in the way of you know, checks and balances. I and mean, we have editorial and good at spotting when there's mistakes, but it's hard to get your finger on the pulse of what the readers are going to go crazy for. Now, is this something where um, you're able to collaborate with the writer? Let's say you're looking over the script and you've got an idea about, you know, hey, you've got this down as five, panel, uh, five uh, panels on this page, but I think we could do it as, you know, four, or we could do it as six, and by adding this element it will, you know, A, B, C the story or something like that. Is, is it something where you, you have the ability to to collaborate that way, or is it something where you strictly just have to execute a little bit, uh, you know, just execute what they're giving you? It's it's often a case-to-case -case basis, honestly. Um, if you feel, the more consistent you are professionally, the more uh, trust you get from your editorial. The editorial is generally the final say in what happens. Uh, but, uh, you know, if they trust you, come forward with suggestions for changes. The book I've been working on now is called Redo. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was adapted from a movie script. And the uh, another artist did layouts for it. I was brought in after to, to kind of finish it up. And uh, my the way I tell a story versus the way the other artist tells a story is completely different. And I can't see the storytelling from his perspective. And so when I was telling, when I was uh, going through his layouts and you know reading the scripts, I would see it differently. You know, he liked to do lots of panels, liked to do you know a little more, say like Watchmen, Dave Gibbons style, where you'd have lots of nine, twelve panel pages, uh, and I saw things as uh, stripping it down a lot more. Mm -hmm. So I, I had the trust of the editor and the trust of the other artist to make some of those changes. You kind of now have this weird marriage of different styles and things, but it, it's, it was all based on trust and the knowledge that we both knew how to tell a story, but since I was the one who was doing all the art for it, you know, they had to trust that you know, the way I was going to do it was going to tell the story. I had another experience with uh, in Doctor Who with a writer who had just come from doing uh, novels. He was just a you know, sort of a classic author, and he was doing his first Doctor Who comic book. And 
as he wrote the script, he basically saw every little action that was handled. And it was not, he was not wrong in that. You know, it's, it's how he saw the story. But when it went down on a page, you can't really have many 12 panel pages. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're dragging your, your reader's eyes to this insane minutia. And, uh, you know, it takes away from the story. So I had to sit down with, I had to, you know, sit down with him and with the editor and say, okay, we've got to strip it down because it's just not going to, it's not going to read. The, the, the readers are going to get halfway through this and just be overwhelmed with, with content to have to process, especially the little tiny little frames, <laughs> you know, all jammed up next to each other. So there's, there's give and take, but it's really about your reputation and the trust you have with people you work with. Now you mentioned that you uh, you had done some finishing on someone else's uh, I would assume pencils. Uh, what would be the difference between uh, someone who does full pencils and someone who does breakdowns? Uh, well, full pencils. We've we've had the process of penciling and inking for a long time in mm -hmm. the comic business, and it's 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 a weird process that still exists mainly because it only existed twenty it existed twenty thirty years ago, and no one's got. Rid of it. Um, the the idea of breakdowns is just an idea. Of, it's it's like blocking. It's uh, you know uh, think of it sort of like a, you know on set when you have actors coming in. Uh, you know when you want to set them up on your stage, you have you know uh, standings so you can set your cameras up and figure out where everything's going to go. Those people are not the people who are doing the, who are doing the actual acting. They're just standing in for the actors. When you have someone doing breakdowns, you're just saying, okay, I've got my panel, you know, this, our screen is the panel, and I'm going to have a head here, and I'm going to have in the background another person here. That's a breakdown. Pencil is, you know, all the details, this is the expression they're going to make, this is the, the way the lighting is going to be, the shadows and everything. Breakdowns is just a very simple way of, you know, it's sort of a, it's sort of a shorthand communication to another artist. It says, head here, person standing in the background there, you know. So they don't, you know, do something completely different. They do two people standing parallel to each other. Right. I see. Because I've, I've read that in the, in the credits many times. Um, I think Frank Miller was uh, doing that a lot on his uh, Daredevil run, where he would do a breakdown of the page and then give it to Klaus Janssen to, to finish and finish the pencils and do the inks, of course. And, uh, put out some of the, the most beautiful comics I've ever seen. Uh, so I guess, yeah, like you're saying, it requires the, a level of trust between the, the yeah. artistic and, pair. And it, it varies between, you know, different artists, what degree you can call something breakdown on versus a pencil and such. Um, the reason I, I say that the idea of penciling is sort of uh, an old-fashioned thing is I've actually switched to completely digital work. And so the process of penciling, or doing breakdowns, or doing inks is all abstract. I can do an illustration, and it is you know, whatever I deem it to be. It's digital. It doesn't have to be pencils, then inks, and such. I mean, we, we did it back then because we had you know, photostat machines that needed you know, black lines, and we had relief presses that needed black line plate and colored plates and things like that. Nowadays, I mean, we have very sophisticated printing processes, and we can print whatever the heck we want. No one actually has to eat a page or has to pencil a page. You can print whatever image you draw in any quality that needs to be done. So we kind of have that process just because the readers are used to seeing inked images, you know, black lines and stuff. But when you look at J.H. You know, Williams, or you look at Barbara uh, Bonito, or all sorts of Tommy Lee Edwards, Closer to home, uh, you know the 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 end result has has radically changed, and it's allowed us to take a look at our earlier process and say that we don't need all these steps. Now, when you uh, work digitally, are you working on like a tablet with a, a stylus? Is it something where you're using a mouse? Is it is it something where uh, I don't know? You're using the power of your brain. I'm not sure how that works. Is there? Could you explain that a little bit for us? Yeah, I, I work on a, uh, on a what's known as a Cintiq. It's a uh, it's a basically it's a, it's a monitor screen that I can draw on, and uh, 
it, it basically emulates the drawing board. You know, I have a pen, this SNT pen, and my monitor is just off the screen here, and uh, it's replaced my drawing table. You know, I, I use Photoshop, Manga Studio, and that you know, emulates my paper and my art supplies. And uh, yeah, you just do illustrations like that. It's so much easier for me uh, to work digitally these days. I mean, when I work traditionally, if I'm inking a page and I make a mistake, well, that mistake is on that page. Mm -hmm. If I'm working digitally and I make a mistake or just make something I don't quite like, I can erase it. I can change the size of it. You know, I say, well, I made that character too big on the page. Well, I could just select that character and make it a little smaller. And it allows me to become more, uh, uh, a more omnipotent storyteller. Mm -hmm. You know, when I work, when artists work traditionally, they do their layouts very small, like two by three inches, and they try and block everything out, and make sure everything is in the right space for the story. Uh, but once they've done their layout and they start penciling it, they're pretty much committed to the way it is. With digital, you know, if I do a layout and I start doing the full size version, and I see that it's not working out the way I want it to, I can just adjust it, and fix it. Because it's really easy, and so it makes my ability to tell stories that much better. Interesting. I, I spoke with uh, Kevin McGuire of Justice League fame, uh, I guess now Guardians of the Galaxy, and he was saying that uh, he made the switch to uh, digital art, and then he realized that it wasn't speeding him up at all, and it also kind of uh, cut into the secondary uh, market of, you know, sometimes you can sell your, your previous artwork uh, online or something like that. Now. Uh, on your website, you posted some examples of storyboard work that you've done. Now, what are the differences in storytelling techniques for comics and storyboards for television and film? Uh, <clears throat> well, with storyboards, it's storyboards. I mean, are, are essentially emulations of film prior to them actually being filmed. So, with the storyboard, you have to capture a lot more of the moment to moment. You know, anytime there's a camera change, anytime there's a camera movement uh, or a switching of the staging, you have to capture that in your storyboard. With comic books, you don't capture every single moment. You capture only the moments that are key to the story. So you can have a whole conversation happen, happen in a panel. Whereas when you shoot a movie, if you're having a conversation, there's camera cuts, there's switching between face to face. And with your storyboard, you have to capture all of that because you have to give not only the sense of where the camera is, but the sense of pacing of a, of a two-hour film. Because if you just do just the if you do the comic book equivalent of storyboards, you're going to have no idea how it plays out as a two-hour film. You have no idea if this conversation takes too long, or if the number of camera cuts makes the audience, you know, sick of seeing these two faces, or the way the camera moves makes people nauseous when they look at it, or something like that. You know, so you have to. You're playing, you're pretending to be the camera when you're doing storyboards. And the camera sees a whole lot more than the comic sees. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, too. Uh, I, I've been to movies where you're watching and you do get a little bit dizzy because of the quick cuts. The, the one that comes to mind is the, uh, the Born Identity series. Uh, I think the second and third film in particular, films in particular, there were a lot more you know, handheld cameras and it, it did become a little dizzy. And whereas you can use that to an effect, I, I'm fairly certain. Uh, that it will also sometimes take away from your, your main message. Um, now, I do have a, a question about motion comics. Uh, now, you worked on the Astonishing X-Men motion comic. How is working on a motion comic from your end different from working on, you know, just a regular printed or digital comic? Well, the, 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 there's some fun challenges to motion comics. The, the thing that is honestly really different about it is that the source material exists and is essentially key to what you're doing. Uh, with Astonishing X-Men, we were using John Cassidy's art. And so we had to animate it, and we had to make it move. And part of that involved actually getting John Cassidy to come in and do extra artwork for the, for the book. But the other part was having to do extra art ourselves. And so you had a studio of people there who essentially trained themselves to draw like John Cassidy and, and uh, do these extra pieces. And the nice thing about motion comics is it's sort of a, it's it's not animation and it's not comic books it's something in between whereas you look at animation and it's a lot of stripped down elements it's it's 
sort of uh, illustration shortcut where you don't have you know beautifully rendered things with cross hatching and, and different you know, gradients and such like that like traditional animation. Uh, you can take a comic book, which is you know, each page has had you know, hours and hours put into it, and then you can see who you can see the style of that artist accurately emulated as a, as a you know, as a character walks across the screen or as you know, Colossus throws Wolverine into the sky. You know, uh, we can make that happen. We can bring those pages to the life. So there's a certain magic to it. Uh, for me, getting to work on it was was fun one because I'm a huge fan story but too because I got to you know do John Cassidy style work uh, on John Cassidy's own you know, book and I'm a huge fan of his I've had the pleasure of knowing him for a number of years I find it really fantastic. It's interesting and now uh, we have just a, a few minutes left um, so I wanted to ask about um, comic conventions now you and I as I, I said before we met briefly at the NC Comic Con you uh, we're very generous with your time. You were drawing, uh, I think, a Matt Smith picture, and uh, I was asking you how you drew hair because that's one of the things as a you know a guy who sits around his house sometimes doing some drawing. That's always something that baffled me, and you gave me some great advice on that. So, how important are conventions to you, to your your bank account, to your fans, to future work? Uh, conventions, like all things, are, are kind of a balance. You have to you have to know what your schedule is. You have to know what you're getting out of it. And uh, a, a lot of people, uh, there are some people out there who, who their career is going to conventions. They are artists who have established themselves just enough in the comic industry and have decided to spend all year going to conventions. And there are enough conventions now that they can do that. But uh, it's, it's a give and take. You know, last year I did 21 conventions, and that was far more than I probably should have done because I got far less work than I, far less work done than I wanted to. The problem is when you go to a convention, you obviously have the two or three days you're there, but then you also have the day before where you're traveling and the day after where you're traveling. So suddenly a three-day convention takes away five days of work time away from you. And sometimes you're, you know, you're jet lagged after it and you're sick and suddenly you've taken six days away from it or even seven days. And when you have 21 conventions, sometimes that's you know, a huge amount of time. Uh, so this year I'm doing seven conventions, <laughs> not less. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a wonder for me because I've gotten so much more work done. And, uh, well, I'm being told that we've, we've run out of time. I hate to cut you off uh, in the middle of this, but Josh, I do want to thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Uh, you've been watching Comic Culture. We've been speaking with Josh Adams. We hope you'll join us again next time for another episode of Comic Culture.